intimacy and uh, there's a bit of an echo and I, I thought it best to, to bring out uh, uh, this is our wedding dress this Lily's wedding uh, dress is it beautiful <laughs> right and uh, I think I have Yana's wedding dress as well there you go how beautiful is this So while we're talking about, uh, thank you, while we're talking about uh, intimacy, I thought it best to zoom into the concept that, among other things, Jesus calls us his bride, right? And, and one of the few things that is only shared by, by, by a bride and a groom, a husband and a wife, is intimacy. Am I, am I right? So, so when, when Christ says to us, you are my bride, it communicates something of an intimate relationship that he wished to have with us. It communicates his heart and the closeness with which he wants to walk a journey with us. There's a couple of things. I mean, he calls us his children. He calls us, we are made in his image and his likeness. He calls us, you know, all these other things. But what I want to zoom in on this morning is the fact that he calls us his bride. And I remember on my wedding day on the, on the 20. Uh, 9th of September, two years ago, uh, no, almost, it's not two years, almost two years, yeah, it's a year and a half. Uh, a tato, until then, she was my girlfriend and then my fiance and, and all those things, right? And, and it was fine, I loved her, it was amazing, it was cool. But in that moment when she came walking down the aisle, she was no longer my fiance or my girlfriend. She was now my bride. And I was so overwhelmed with emotions because something so beautiful was about to happen. There was a transition that was happening from a different kind of relationship to a deeper one. And I stood there and I started asking myself, why are you crying? <laughs> but because there was a sense of 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 depth. There was a sense of longing. There was a sense of celebration. I was overwhelmed with emotions to say, she is not just, you know, my partner and whatever. She is now my bride. And that's the relationship, that's the kind of relationship that Jesus Christ wants to have with us. He looks up from heaven. He looks up around us. And he stood on the cross and he died for us because when he looks at us, he sees his bride. He says, you are my bride. He looks at us with excitement. He looks at us with love. He looks at us with, with joy in his heart. And, 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 and as I was preparing, I came across this story. And I just want to read it to you just to kind of drive this point home. Uh, this story goes. When I got home that night, my wife served dinner. And I held her hand and said, I've got something to tell you. She sat down and ate quietly. Again, I observed the hurt in her eyes. Suddenly, I didn't know how to open my mouth. But I had to let her know what I was thinking about. I was thinking about divorce. I raised the topic calmly. She didn't seem to be annoyed by my words. Instead, she asked softly, why? I avoided her question. This made her angry. She threw chopsticks at my way and shouted at me, You are not a man. That night, we didn't talk to each other. She wept. I knew she wanted to know what had happened to our marriage, but I could hardly give her a satisfactory answer. She had lost my heart to Jane. I didn't love her anymore. I just pitied her. With a deep sense of guilt, I drafted a divorce agreement which stated that she could own a house, our car, and 30% stake of my company. She glanced at it and tore it into pieces. The woman who had, who had spent 10 years of her life with me had become a stranger. I felt sorry for her wasted time, resources, energy, but I could not take back what I had said. I loved Jane so dearly. Finally, she cried out loud, in front, out loud in front of me, which was when 
which is, which is what I had expected. The idea of divorce, which had obsessed me for several weeks, seemed to be firm and clear now. The next day, I came back from home very late and found her writing something on the table. I did not have supper. I went straight to bed and fell asleep very fast because I had a tiring day, uh, an eventful day with Jane. When I woke up, she was still there at the table writing. I just didn't care, and I turned over and continued sleeping. In the morning, she presented her divorce conditions. She didn't want anything to do with me, but, I need, but, but needed a month notice before the divorce. She requested that in that one month, we both struggled to live together as peacefully as possible. Her reasons were simple. Our son had an exam in, the month, in a month's time, and she didn't want to disrupt him with our broken marriage. This was agreeable to me, but she had something more. She asked me to recall how I carried her into our bridal room on our wedding day. She requested that every day of that month, during, uh, during that month, I carry her out of the bedroom to the front door every morning. I thought she was going crazy. Just to make the last day together bearable, I accepted her odd request. I told Jane about my wife's condition. She laughed, she laughed loudly and thought it was absurd. Not wanting to, uh, no amount of tricks can uh, work here. She has to face that you are divorcing her, she said scornfully. My wife and I had not had any body contact since my divorce intention was explicitly expressed. So when I carried her out for the first day, we both appeared clumsy. Our son clapped hands behind me. Daddy is holding mommy in his arms. His word brought a sad sense of sensation to me. It brought a sense of pain to me from the bedroom to the sitting room, then the door. I walked over 10 meters with her in my arms. She closed her eyes and softly said, do not tell our son about the divorce. I nodded, feeling somewhat upset. I put her down uh, outside the door. She went on to wait for the bus and I drove to work alone. On the second day, both of us acted with much ease. She leaned on my chest. I could smell her fragrance on her blouse. I realized that I had not looked at this woman carefully for a long time. I realized she was not young anymore. There was a fine wrinkle on her face. The hair was gray. Our marriage had taken its toll on her. And for a minute, I wondered, what have I done to her? On the fourth day, I lifted her up. I felt a sense of intimacy returning. This was the woman who had given 10 years of her time, of her life, to me. On the fifth and sixth day, I realized that a sense of intimacy was growing again. I didn't tell Jane about this. It became easier to carry her as the month slipped by. Perhaps the everyday worked out made me stronger. She was choosing what to wear one morning. She tried on a few dresses but could not fit into any one of them suitably. Then she sighed. All my dresses have grown bigger. I suddenly realized that she had grown thin. That's the reason why carrying her had become so easy. Suddenly it hit me. She had, she had, the, she had, she had buried that much pain and bitterness in her heart. Subconsciously, I reached out and touched her hair. Our son came into the room and said, Daddy, it's time to carry mommy out. To him, seeing his father carrying his mother out uh, had become an essential part of his life. My wife gestured to our son to come closer and hug him tightly. I turned my face away because I was afraid I might change my mind at the last moment. I had I held her in her arm. I held her in my arms. Walked from the bedroom through the sitting room through the the hall the hallway. 
Her hands sur surrounded my neck softly and naturally, and her body tightly. It was like our wedding day. But her much lighter weight made me sad. On the last day, when I held her in my arms, I could hardly move a step. Our son had gone to school. I held her tight and said, I had noticed that our life lacked intimacy. I drove to the office, jumped out of the car swiftly and without locking the door. I was afraid to delay that I might change my mind. I walked and ran upstairs. Jane opened the door and I said to her, sorry, Jane, I do not want a divorce anymore. She looked at me astonished and touched my forehead. Do you have a fever? She said. I moved her hand. Sorry, Jane. I said, I do not want a divorce. My marriage life was boring probably because she and I did not value the details of our life, not because we didn't love each other anymore. Now I realize that since I carried her in, into my home on our wedding day, I was supposed to hold her until death do us part. Jane seemed to suddenly wake up. She gave me a loud slap and slammed the door and busted into tears. I walked downstairs and drove away. I went to the florist shop on my way home and I ordered a bouquet of flowers for my wife. Uh, the sales girl asked me what she should write on the card and I smiled and I wrote, I will carry you out every morning until death do us part. I will carry you out every morning until death do us part. My question this morning is, who and what is your Jane? Because every one of us in our lives, we have a Jane. At one point or another in our lives, we have a Jane. I have had a Jane, not in my marriage, but I've had a Jane. And this Jane can be a lot of things. At one point in our life, we all have a Jane, and that Jane is that one thing that robs us of enjoying intimacy with God. That one thing that robs us of worshiping God in spirit and in truth. That one thing that robs us of worshiping God without caring what everyone is thinking. That one thing that robs us of spending time meditating on the word of God. That one thing that stops us and robs us from waiting on God in prayer and fasting. That one thing that robs us from hearing from God clearly. We all at one point in our life, we have Jane in our lives. What has become your Jane? What is that one thing that has robbed you of spending intimate time, of living in intimacy with God? For some, it is fear, and for some, it is work. For others, it is culture, and for others, it is past hurt and disappointment. Sometimes it is pride, and sometimes it's self-sufficiency. We all at one point in our life have a Jane who robs us, which robs us of an intimate time with God. What is your Jane? Intimacy. Intimacy is a noun that comes from the Italian word intimere, which means impress or to make familiar, which comes from a Latin word which means intimus, which means in a most. Intimacy with God means to have an inner most connection with God. Intimacy moves us. And this is what I want you to hear clearly. Intimacy with God moves us from acting out of habit into acting out of hunger. It replaces what we do out of habit into doing it out of hunger. It is easy for us to come to church out of habit. It is easy for us to read the word of God out of habit. It is easy to worship God out of habit. It is easy to praise God out of habit. It is easy to do godly things, religious things out of habit. And that can never ever produce fruit. It is the hunger for God that produces fruit, not the habit for the things of God. 
It is when we have a hunger for Jesus Christ, when we have a hunger for the Word of God, when we have a hunger to worship Him, that we begin to see the fruits of worshiping and walking intimately with Him, not when we're doing it out of habit. It is easy to fall into the habit of doing godly things. And habit robs us of walking intimately with God. This intimate connection is characterized by hunger and not habit. When we worship, we worship him. In this kind of intimacy, we worship him out of hunger and not habit. We give him praise out of hunger and not habit. We spend time with him out of hunger and not habit. We come to church out of hunger for him and not habit. That's why in Matthew 5, the Bible says, Blessed, joyful, nourished by God's goodness are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Those who actively seek to be in right standing with God, for they will be completely satisfied. The habit for the things of God can never satisfy us. It is the hunger for God that truly satisfies our souls. So when we speak about intimacy, we speak about going beyond doing what is habitual, and responding to the hunger and thirst in us, in our soul. David says, you have knitted my innermost being. There is something in our innermost that was created by God that consistently seeks for God. And cannot be satisfied by anything else but being intimately uh, related and connected to him. That's why you see people after they live their lives without God and, 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 and they come to a point where, you know, after going to the Buddhists and going to the mountains and going to all these things, just trying to seek and find something, they realize that, you know what? My soul has always just longed for its creator. So intimacy is not something that we need to manufacture. It's something that is actually innate within us. It is something that, that was birthed in us. What steals, what steals our intimacy steals our fruitfulness. What steals our intimacy steals our, our fruitfulness. The Bible in John, in John 15 verses uh, 4, I just want to quickly read it here. Uh, John, do you have your Bible here with you? You have your uh, cell phone Bible. <laughs> I'm not going to judge anyone. There's nothing, there's nothing special about having this one and having on the one on the cell phone. It's kind of the same thing. It's the Word of God. So it's John 15, verses, verses 4. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And it's funny that at this time he had spent so much time with his disciples. He had spent a considerable time, a couple of years with his disciples. But now he tells them this, which can, can sound a bit strange. He says to them, remain in me as I also remain in you. It's strange to me because how can you say to me, remain in me when I've been walking with you for two years? The disciple had been walking with Jesus for two years, but then he says to them, remain in me as I remain in you. Why? Because it is possible to be busy with the things of God and not have a relationship with the God of the things. It is easy to do the work of God and, not for, and to miss out on God doing the work in you. It is easy to do the work of God and not spend time with God. It is easy to get busy with what God has sent you to do and not spend time with the God who has sent you to do. And he was saying to his disciples, it matters not what you can do for me. What matters is what you do with me. What matters is what you do 
When you are with me, when you are sitting with me, he says, abide in me. You know, in, 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 I have it in, in, in a few translations. In, 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 in the NIV, it says, remain in me as I remain in you. In the message translation, it says, live in me. Make your home in me just as I do in you. And in, in the, uh, uh, the New, James, uh, New King James translation, it says, abide in me. And I love that word, abide. I love that word abide is a Greek word for meno, which means to remain as one. Jesus says to his disciples, remain as one with me. In the world where we're busy with so many things, remain as one with Jesus Christ. In a world where there's so many cultures, so many religions, and so many traditions, remain as one with Jesus Christ. In a world where there's so many opinions about who to, op- who to worship, so many options about who to worship, there's so, many, there's so many gods out there in millions of who to worship, remain as one with Jesus Christ. The question is, are we coming in and out of relationship with Jesus or are we remaining? The invitation is remain as one, abide in me. That's why I say what robs us of our intimacy robs us of our fruitfulness because the Bible says if you remain in me you will produce fruit but a branch cannot produce fruit outside the vine and he says I am the vine and my father is the vine dresser you know when you when you have remained in Jesus You no longer ask the question whether it is right or wrong. You ask the question, does it reflect my oneness with Jesus? You don't live life. We don't live life to ask ourselves, is this right or is this wrong? We ask the question, am I, is this reflecting my oneness with Jesus Christ? For the married people, this is parental guidance advised. We know that intimacy has fruit. Pregnancy is a result of intimacy. So you come together with the one you love. As the bride and the groom come together in intimate moment, God activates something inside the bride. When we walk in intimacy with God, God activates destiny in us. When we walk in intimacy with God, there is no way destiny cannot be activated in us. There is no way we can walk in intimacy with God and not see fruit. There is no way. He is a fruitful God. He is a God who multiplies. He is a God who created everything out of nothing. And as we sit with Him in intimacy, something gets activated in us. Something of a pregnancy with destiny gets activated within us. And here's the thing about pregnancy. Sometimes you are in your first trimester. Sometimes you are in your second trimester. And sometimes you are in your third trimester. But as long as you have walked in intimacy with God, you are pregnant with destiny. And some of you are sitting here. You are in your first trimester. You are in your first trimester where it does not look like something is happening. Nothing, not, you are not even aware that you are pregnant with destiny. But let me tell you one thing. If you have walked with Jesus Christ, you are pregnant. Whether you know it or you do not know it, he has deposited something inside of you because that's the fruit of intimacy. Whether you know it or you don't know it. Whether you feel it or you don't feel it, whether you have morning sickness or you don't have morning sickness, he has deposited his destiny inside of you. Whether they see it or they do not see it, there is destiny inside of you. 
Don't let them say there is no destiny because they cannot see it. A woman who is one month pregnant is pregnant. She is not less pregnant than the woman who is eight months pregnant just because we do not see it. And just because you don't feel it, you don't see it, I want to declare upon your life, you are pregnant with destiny. That is the fruit of walking in intimacy with Jesus Christ. He says, if you abide in me and I abide in you, you will bear much fruit. You will bear much fruit and I feel like I want to talk to somebody this morning who says, I don't feel like I'm pregnant with destiny. You don't have to feel like it. You are. (laughs) No one sees it. You are not, you are not, your, 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 your shape of your body has not changed. And you feel like you are useless. You feel like God doesn't want to use you. You feel like God does not have a plan with your life. Because you have not started seeing something. But the Bible declares, if you abide in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Don't abort your destiny because you are in the first trimester and you do not see it with your eyes. Don't despise what God is doing in your life because you are in your first month of pregnancy and you cannot see it with your eyes. And then there are those that are in in their second trimester. In the second trimester now, your body has begun to take a different shape. And guess what? The things that used to fit you, they don't fit you anymore. The things that used to fit you, your clothes that used to fit you, they cannot fit you anymore. There is evidence that you have been intimate with with the groom. And some of you, you are in a season where you are losing friend left, right, and center. You are losing friend because there is destiny beginning to grow inside of you and they do not fit anymore. They need to go. There's certain things that will not fit anymore in your life because there is destiny. You start losing certain things and certain people and asking yourself, why am I losing people? Why am I losing these things? Because they don't fit anymore. Destiny is growing inside of you. There are friends of mine that when I sit down with, when I try to have a conversation with, I cannot talk to them because we're not speaking the same language. Why? Because destiny has begun to grow and they do not understand. They say, you think you are better. No, I don't think I'm better. I am better because there is destiny of God growing in the inside of me. There is destiny growing and and I am outgrowing certain things because I cannot spend intimate time with my father and not be pregnant with destiny. It's go- the pregnancy is going to disrupt your life. If you are not ready for a disruption, you are not ready to give birth to the destiny that God has given you. It is going to disrupt your life. Your life is going to turn upside down. You will have mood swings. You will not sleep well at night. It will keep you up at night. That's the mark of destiny. And then, and then there are those who are in their third trimester. It's tough. It's tough. It's tough. It's tough. God, I can't do this. Jesus Christ, when he was in his third trimester, he says to God, can this cup be taken away from me? It's tough. Our Lord and Savior, when he was about to fulfill what he is, he, he came here to do, when the moment had arrived for him to give birth to that which God had placed inside of him, he said, God, I cannot do this. It is tough. Please take this cup away from me. No. 
You're sitting here and like, this is the wife that God has given me, but this marriage is tough. This is the business that God has given me, but this thing is tough. I don't want to do it anymore. I want it to stop. Because the pains, they're just so unbearable. Someone who's sitting here and says, I can't do it anymore. I cannot take another step. And then, and then Jesus says, but not my will. But your will. Can I encourage you this morning? Don't give in. Don't give up. Don't give in. Don't give up. It is the fruit of what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has placed inside of you as a result of the intimate time that you have spent with Him. Do not abort the baby. Do not abort the destiny. Do not abort the mission. Do not walk away from the purpose that God has called you for regardless of how intimate, how difficult it is. Because He says, I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. I will be there every step of the way holding your hand like the groom stands at the labor bed with his wife holding his hand God says to you I am close to you in your time of most desperate need he says I am with you push it says I am with you press it says I know <laughs> I was talking to a friend recently they have been working on a project for five years and the enemy came and wanted to steal this contract due to corruption so there was corruption in in government and they wanted to steal this contract that they had been working for for five years just as they were about to get the project the the enemy came and the project was taken away from you and from them and this guy said you know what we decided we serve a strong and mighty God we are not going to back down we are going to push and their attitude to push has turned the whole thing around. The minister has stepped in. The high people have stepped in and said, these people are going to get this project. Because what the enemy meant for bad, God is meaning for good as long as we push. Do not stop fighting for the destiny that was placed in there by the seed of God inside of you. Push. Fight for it. Fight for it. Because the morning, the morning turns into dancing. The morning turns into dancing. And in this moment, we are going to press in. We're going to press in in worship this morning. Because Paul and Silas, while they were in prison, they pressed in, in worship, and the gates of prison were broken. Whatever was keeping them from releasing their destiny was broken because they pressed in, in worship. They were not concerned about the jail that they were in. They were concerned about the relationship and intimate relationship that they were in with Jesus Christ. And this morning, we just want to press in in worship. And as you press in this morning, think about that which God has laid inside of you. A 
and trust God for a push in the spirit. I'm challenging you as we are about to worship right now, push in the spirit. Jacob said to God, I am not letting go until you bless me. I am holding on. I am trusting this morning that you will have the same attitude that Jacob had and say, I am pressing on. I am not letting go of this moment until you bless me. We're going to sing a few songs. I want you to have that destiny in mind and push. Father, we thank you. We honor you that we can abide in you as you abide in us. That you have birthed something in us. That you have birthed something in us. And now is the season to push. And in worship, we're pushing. says, draw close to me and I'll draw close to you. Draw close to God in this moment. Just take some time and just to, to in your spirit, draw close to God.